Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 120, Finding Your 2024 Peak Performance Zone, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we do a little reflection of this past year, see if we hit our targets or not, decide what's next for 2024 and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, that I have the world's largest database of off-ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to sweethockeycoach.com, that's sweethockeycoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Here we are at the very beginning, crossing the threshold into a brand spanking new year. I know everyone out there had some special moments happen from time to time throughout the year, but there's also a high likelihood that you may have also had some real challenges and had to endure incredible sadness and loss, as I recently did, losing my Uncle Todd. When you're having to go through a tough patch and find ourselves swimming in a pool of Ixos, it can be difficult to get our life back on track, being productive like we were before the event or experience. But what happens when times aren't challenging, things are going okay to really good, but you still lack the drive and motivation to get things done on a regular basis? The last four to five years during the holiday season, November and December, before the new year arrives, I find myself slipping into reflection mode, doing a little self-analysis to see overall if it was a year of progress or not. What I mean by that is, did I accomplish what I'd hoped when I was doing this same exercise 365 days ago? If I'm honest with myself, I failed to even start some objectives, had some consistent forward movement on a few projects, and a couple home runs where I absolutely crushed it most weeks. So here's the deal with this segment. I didn't want to do an episode on New Year's resolutions because as we found out last year around this time in episode 81, have you set your 2023 big goal? That New Year's resolutions don't work. Here's a quick recap of some of the science behind the findings. In a 2014 report, 35% of participants who failed their New Year's resolutions admitted they had unrealistic goals. 33% of participants did not keep track of their progress, and 23% forgot all about them. About 1 in 10 respondents claimed they made too many resolutions. A 2007 study by Richard Wiseman from the University of Bristol involving 3,000 people showed that 88% of those who set New Year's resolutions fail, despite the fact that 52% of the study's participants were confident of success at the beginning. Men achieved their goal 22% more often when they engaged in goal setting, wherein resolutions are made in terms of small and measurable goals. Example, lose a pound a week rather than lose weight. Pretty compelling evidence to look for an alternative method or technique for New Year's resolutions. I was listening to some book earlier in the week, and I really connected with this quote by Michael Hyatt. Most people spend more time planning a one-week vacation than they spend planning their life. End quote. I would say that there were sections in my life where that was me, just floating along, bouncing from one thing to another, always busy, not a lot of self-discipline, and never really accomplishing anything of significance. I finally came to a point where I had enough and was determined to get my life back on the rails 
start defining what the heck I'm going to be remembered for, stop disappointing people, and start the evolution of what will become the new me. I remember hearing something somewhere, I can't remember the exact moment in time, a quote that has always hung around in my mind year after year, like a song you can't get out of your head, and it always seemed to resurface when I wanted to make a change in my life regarding something I wasn't happy with. If not now, when? Let me repeat that. If not now, when? Four words, pretty powerful. I don't know. I'm kind of rambling here. But have any of you out there had something that has been lingering around in your mind that you wanted to eliminate from your day-to-day -day life, which also involves adding something new, a replacement, that you hope will improve your life and overall happiness? I hope so. Because a lot of times I feel like I'm on an island by myself dealing with these goofy and weird thoughts. If there's one thing that has helped me navigate through these choppy waters over the years are books. And learning all kinds of strategies and techniques on how to define what you want and then map out your process of daily disciplines in order to reach your peak performance zone on a more consistent basis. What I'd like to share with you for the rest of this episode are some ideas from books that have crossed my path at some point, had something in it I resonated with, resulting in me implementing the suggestions, and over time seeing very recognizable, noticeable improvements in whatever I had decided to devote my full attention to. About three to four years ago, I implemented a major self-improvement habit to my daily disciplines, and it changed my life for the better. My oldest son, Rem, suggested I start listening to books and podcasts when I work out. I'm always open to new suggestions, but for some reason I was reluctant to even entertain the idea of changing my workout routine that I've done basically my whole life. I always thought that when I was working out, I was programmed to disconnect from the real world, listen to music that pumped me up, and I just got to work. I can't remember exactly what prompted me to give book listening a try, because in my mind, I was already reading on a consistent basis before I went to bed for 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe it was the relentless fort check of REM that finally got me to surrender, but I did, got a 30-day trial with Audible, and have been consuming book after book ever since. I'm in my third straight year of always consuming books or podcasts when I'm working on my fitness, and I'm grateful for REM's persistence. What I've realized the past two years from adding this daily discipline is that I feel so much better, more motivated, and generally have an increase in overall happiness. I've found that when I intentionally consume productive media, not what all the social channels want me to watch, I'm more positive, optimistic, motivated, and most days I have to pinch myself to make sure that it's real, as I'm so grateful for my life, for what I get to do, and the people I have relationships with. That little adjustment when working out has literally changed my life for the better. Maybe some of what you're about to hear will help you make a positive shift as well. With all that being said, let's get to the books where I'm going to share some of the strategies and techniques on how to define what you want and then map out your process of daily disciplines in order to reach your peak performance zone on a more consistent basis. Let's begin. Book number one, Hyper Focus, How to Be More Productive in a World of Distraction. By Chris Bailey. Quote number one. Above all else, I began to view attention as the most important ingredient we can add if we're to become more productive, creative, and happy at work and at home. When we invest our limited attention intelligently and deliberately, we focus more deeply and think more clearly. This is an essential skill in today's world when we are so often in distracting environments doing brain-heavy work. This book takes you on a tour through my exploration of the subject of focus. I'll share not only the fascinating things I've learned, but also how to actually put those ideas to use in your own life. I've road tested all of them. Productivity research is great, but pretty useless when you don't act upon it. In this way, I see hyperfocus as a sort of science help book, one that explores the fascinating research behind how you focus 
but also bridges those insights with your daily life to explore ways you can manage your attention better to become more productive and creative. These ideas have already changed one life, mine, and I know they can do the same for you too. On the surface, the results can seem a bit like magic, but magic stops being magic the moment you know how it's done. End quote. Quote number two, productivity redefined. After years of researching the topic, I found that productivity has become a bit of a loaded term. What it usually connotates is a condition that feels cold, corporate, and overly focused on efficiency. I prefer a different and friendlier definition. Productivity means accomplishing what we intend to. If our plan today is to write 3,000 words, rock a presentation with our leadership team, and catch up on our email, and we successfully accomplish all of those, we were perfectly productive. Likewise, if we intend to have a relaxing day and manage to do absolutely nothing, we're again perfectly productive. Being busy doesn't make us productive. It doesn't matter how busy we are if that busyness doesn't lead us to accomplish anything of importance. Productivity is not about cramming more into our days, but doing the right thing in each moment. End quote. Quote number three. Hyperfocus. When you hyperfocus on a task, you expand one task, project, or other object of attention so it fills your attentional space completely. You enter this mode by managing your attention deliberately and purposefully by choosing one important object of attention, eliminating distractions that will inevitably arise as you work, and then focusing on just one task. Hyperfocus is many things at once. It's deliberate, undistracted, and quick to refocus, and it leads to become completely immersed in our work. It also makes us immensely happy. Recall how energized you were by your work the last time you found yourself in this state. In hyperfocus, you might even feel more relaxed than you usually are when you work. Allowing one task or project to consume your full attentional space means this state doesn't make you feel stressed or overwhelmed. Your attentional space doesn't overflow and your work doesn't feel nearly as chaotic. Since hyperfocus is so much more productive, you can slow down a bit and still accomplish an incredible amount in a short period of time. End quote. Quote number four, how to get into hyperfocus. The science suggests we pass through four states as we begin to focus. First, we're focused and productive. Then, assuming we don't get distracted or interrupted, our minds begin to wander. Third, we make a note of this mind wandering. This can take a while, especially if we don't frequently check what is consuming our attentional space. On average, we notice about five times in an hour that our mind has wandered. And fourth, we shift our focus back to our original object of attention. End quote. Bonus quote number five, vague intentions to implementation intentions. Some students set a vague intention while others set what Peter Gallwitzer calls an implementation intention. As he explains the term, make a very detailed plan on how you want to achieve what you want to achieve. What I'm arguing in my research is that goals need plans, ideally plans that include when, where, and which kind of action to move toward the goal. In other words, if a student's vague goal was to find an apartment during Christmas break, his implementation intention could be, I will hunt for apartments on Craigslist and email three apartment landlords in the weeks leading up to Christmas. Comparing Gallwitzer's two participant groups is where things got interesting. A remarkable 62% of students who set a specific implementation intention followed through on their goals. The group that did not set an implementation intention fared a lot more poorly. Following through on their original intention a third as often, a paltry 22% of the time. This effect, with subsequent studies validated further, was positively staggering. Setting specific intentions can double or triple your odds of success. With that in mind, 
let's quickly turn my three vague intentions into implementation intentions. Number one, go to the gym becomes schedule and go to the gym on my lunch break. Number two, quitting work when I get home is reframed as put my work phone on airplane mode and my work laptop in another room and stay disconnected for the evening. And number three, go to bed by a reasonable time becomes set a bedtime alarm for 10 p.m. and when it goes off, start winding down. End quote. Bonus quote number six, expanding and contracting your productivity potential. Research shows that attentional space expands and contracts in proportion to how much mental energy we have. Getting enough sleep, for example, can increase the size of attentional space by as much as 58%, and taking frequent breaks can have the same effect. This impacts productivity when attentional space is approximately 60% larger. Productivity can grow by just as much, especially when working on a demanding task. The better rested we are, the more productive we become. End quote. And bonus quote number seven, hyperfocus plus scatter focus. Hyperfocus can help you get an extraordinary amount done in a relatively short period of time. Scatter focus lets you connect ideas, which helps you unearth hidden insights, become more creative, plan for the future, and rest. Together, they will enable you to work and live with purpose. Your attention is the most powerful tool at your disposal to live and work with greater productivity, creativity, and purpose. Managing it well will enable you to spend more time and energy on your most purposeful tasks and to work more often with intention, focus for longer periods, and stumble into fewer unwanted daydreams. I hope you spend it wisely. End quote. Book number two. The Power of Full Engagement Managing energy, not time, is the key to high performance and personal renewal by James E. Lohr and Tony Schwartz Quote number one Every one of our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors has an energy consequence, for better or for worse. The ultimate measure of our lives is not how much time we spend on the planet, but rather how much energy we invest in the time that we have. The premise of this book and of the training we do each year with thousands of clients is simple enough. Performance, health, and happiness are grounded in the skillful management of energy. End quote. Quote number two, the four principles of full engagement. Principle number one, Full engagement requires drawing on four separate but related sources of energy, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. Principle two, because energy diminishes both with overuse and with underuse, we must balance energy expenditure with intermittent energy renewal. Principle three, to build capacity, we must push beyond our normal limits training in the same systematic way that elite athletes do. And principle four, positive energy rituals, highly specific routines for managing energy, are the key to full engagement and sustained high performance. End quote. Quote number three, sprinters versus long distance runners. Think for a moment about the look of many long distance runners. Gaunt, shallow, slightly sunken, and emotionally flat. Now visualize a sprinter, such as Marion Jones or Michael Johnson. Sprinters typically look powerful, bursting with energy and eager to push themselves to their limits. The explanation is simple. No matter how intense the demand they face, the finish line is clearly visible 100 or 200 meters down the track. We too, must learn to live our lives as a series of sprints, fully engaging for periods of time, and then fully disengaging and seeking renewal before jumping back into the fray to face whatever challenges confront us. End quote. Quote number four, the pulse of life. 
Nature itself has a pulse, a rhythmic, wave-like movement between activity and rest. Think about the ebb and flow of the tides, the movement between seasons, and the daily rising and setting of the sun. Likewise, all organisms follow life-sustaining rhythms. Birds migrating, bears hibernating, squirrels gathering nuts, and fish spawning. All of them at predictable intervals. So too, human beings are guided by rhythms. The concept of maximizing performance by alternating periods of activity with periods of rest was first advanced by Flavius Philostratus, AD 170 to 245, who wrote training manuals for Greek athletes. Russian sports scientists resurrected the concept in the 1960s and began applying it with stunning success to their Olympic athletes. Today, work-rest ratios lie at the heart of periodization, a training method used by elite athletes throughout the world. End quote. Bonus quote number five, the time between points. To live like a sprinter is to break life down into a series of manageable intervals consistent with our own psychological needs and with the periodic rhythms of nature. This insight first crystallized for Jim when he was working with world-class tennis players. As a performance psychologist, his goal was to understand the factors that set apart the greatest competitors in the world from the rest of the pack. Jim spent hundreds of hours watching top players and studying tapes of their matches. To his growing frustration, he could detect almost no significant differences in their competitive habits during points. It was only when he began to notice what they did between points that he suddenly saw a difference. While most of them were not aware of it, the best players had each built almost exactly the same set of routines between points. These included the way they walked back to the baseline after a point, how they held their heads and shoulders, where they focused their eyes, the pattern of their breathing, and even the way they talked to themselves. End quote. Bonus quote number six, drink plenty of water, yo. Drinking water, we have found, is perhaps the most undervalued source of physical energy renewal. Unlike hunger, thirst is an inadequate barometer of need. By the time we feel thirsty, we may be long since dehydrated. A growing body of research suggests that drinking at least 64 ounces of water at intervals throughout the day serves performance in a range of important ways. Dehydrate a muscle by as little as 3%, for example, and it will lose 10% of its strength and 8% of its speed. Inadequate hydration also compromises concentration and coordination. End quote. Bonus quote number seven. Turn off the TV, please. Television, for example, is one of the primary means by which most people relax and recover. For the most part, however, television watching is the mental and emotional equivalent of eating junk food. It may provide a temporary form of recovery, but it is rarely nutritious and is easy to consume too much. Researchers such as Mihai Csikszentmihalyi have found that prolonged television watching is actually correlated with increased anxiety and low-level depression. End quote. Bonus quote number eight. To be fully engaged emotionally. To be fully engaged emotionally requires celebrating what the Stoic philosophers called anakaluthia, the mutual entailment of the virtues. By this notion, no virtue is a virtue by itself. Rather, all virtues are entailed. Honesty without compassion, for example, becomes cruelty. End quote. Bonus quote number nine. How am I that? Difficult and unpleasant as it may be to accept, we often feel most hostile to those who remind us of aspects of ourselves that we prefer not to see. Ask someone to give a description of the personality type which he finds most despicable, most unbearable and hateful, and most impossible to get along with, writes Edward Whitmont, and he will produce a description of his own repressed characteristics. 
These very qualities are so unacceptable to him precisely because they represent his own repressed side. Only that which we cannot accept within ourselves do we find impossible to live with in others. Think for a moment of someone you actively dislike. What quality in that person do you find most objectionable? Now ask yourself, how am I that? End quote. Bonus quote number 10. Intrinsic versus extrinsic purpose. Purpose also becomes a more powerful source of energy when it moves from being externally to internally motivated. Extrinsic motivation reflects the desire to get more of something that we don't feel we have enough of. Money, approval, social standing, power, or even love. Intrinsic motivation grows out of the desire to engage in an activity because we value it for the inherent satisfaction it provides. Researchers have long found that intrinsic motivation tends to prompt more sustaining energy. A study conducted by the University of Rochester's Human Motivation Research Group found, for example, that people whose motivation was authentic, defined as self-authored, exhibited more interest, excitement, and confidence, as well as greater persistence, creativity, and performance than a control group of subjects who were motivated largely by external demands and rewards. End quote. Bonus quote number 11, precision and specificity. A broad and persuasive array of studies confirms that specificity of timing and precision of behavior dramatically increase the likelihood of success. The explanation lies once again in the fact that our conscious capacity for self-control is limited and easily depleted. By determining when, where, and how a behavior will occur, we no longer have to think much about getting it done. A series of experiments have confirmed this pattern. In perhaps the most dramatic experiment of all, a group of drug addicts were studied during withdrawal a time when the energy required to control the urge to take drugs severely compromises their ability to undertake nearly any other task. As part of the effort to help them find employment post-rehabilitation, one group was asked to commit to writing a short resume before 5 p.m. on a particular day. Not a single one succeeded. A second group was asked to complete the same task, but also to say exactly when and where they would write the resume. 80% of that group succeeded. End quote. Bonus quote number 12. Positive rituals. We use the word ritual purposefully to emphasize the notion of a carefully defined, highly structured behavior. In contrast to will and discipline, which require pushing yourself to a particular behavior, a ritual pulls at you. Think of something as simple as brushing your teeth. It is not something that you ordinarily have to remind yourself to do. Brushing your teeth is something to which you feel consistently drawn, compelled by its clear health value. You do it largely on autopilot without much conscious effort or intention. The power of rituals is that they ensure that we use as little conscious energy as possible where it is not absolutely necessary leaving us free to strategically focus the energy available to us in creative, enriching ways. All great performers rely on positive rituals to manage their energy and regulate their behavior. The more exacting the challenge and the greater the pressure, the more rigorous our rituals need to be. End quote. And bonus quote number 13. Jump ahead to the end of your life. Across cultures, religions, and time itself, people have admired and aspired to the same universal values, among them integrity, generosity, courage, humility, compassion, loyalty, perseverance, while rejecting their opposites, deceit, greed, cowardice, arrogance, callousness, disloyalty, and sloth. To begin to explore more deeply, the values that are most compelling to you, we suggest that you set aside uninterrupted time to respond to the following questions. Jump ahead to the end of your life. What are the three most important lessons you have learned and why are they so critical? Think of someone you deeply respect. 
Describe three qualities in this person that you most admire. Who are you at your best? What one sentence inscription would you like to see on your tombstone that would capture who you really were in your life? End quote. Well, there you have it. Lots of things to think about as we all settle into 2024. Was there something said that you really connected with? My hope is that there was, and the information you just consumed has enough motivation and willpower to get you over the hump on something going on in your life. Maybe it's eating healthier, working out more consistently, watching less TV, or reduce gaming time. It might even be spending a little more time in your training space at home, working on your stick skills. Whatever your objective is, I hope you get it soon in the new year. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening, and I hope you enjoyed this segment. If you did, and you think there's someone out there in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.